Hello everyone, I am uh, Anupam Roy. I have with me today Dr. Neeti Shikha. She's recently authored the book uh, Changing Paradigms of Corporate uh, Governance in India. Uh, Dr. Neeti Shikha is an Associate Professor of Law at uh, Symbiosis Law School, Noida, in India. Well, I am very curious, uh, Dr. Shikha, about uh, your, your book. Uh, it's a very uh, interesting area you have chosen and something which concerns uh, uh, corporate uh, a great deal these days. Uh, so let's let's just go into, uh, I mean, I, I would like to go into your the contents of your book and uh, like to throw some questions. Uh, uh, what, what, what is, what according to you, I mean, we have had a lot of uh, books on corporate governance, but what according to you is corporate governance? I mean, what, what determines good corporate governance? According to you? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Anupam, for having me here. Uh, now, see, corporate governance is a set of rules and regulations through which companies are governed. Uh, now, you see, there are two types of rules that we look at. Uh, one could be internal rule that is, uh, you know, uh, drafted by the company itself, and we find the mention in the charge of the company, which is basically the memorandum, uh, like memorandum of article. It sets out the objects of the companies, what a company can do. Article association, it it sets out the scope for director's duties, how a director must behave. It also lists out the procedure in which the management of the company has to be carried out. So the internal regulation is basically the chart of the company. Now, when I look at the external regulation, uh, it's basically legislated. The so you, we can have we have uh, at one side we have companies act uh, that uh, that talks about director's duties, that talks about shareholders' rights. We also have listing agreements by stock exchange, uh, which companies sign when they want to get listed. Now, um, if you look at the purpose of corporate governance, um, as much as it, it, it tends to a governed corporation, the larger aim is to, to have a very uh, sound and sustainable corp, uh, you know, business environment. Uh, because at heart of heart, what corporate governance does is, it, it gives direction to the companies, how companies have to have to be managed and perform in the market. And you see, um, it, it reflects directly in the, in the performance of companies in stock market. A company which has a good corporate governance, the shares, uh, um, you know, they soar high. Investors, uh, they believe in those companies which has good governance, a good board of directors, and they're ready to invest in those companies. What, what, what actually, according to you, determines good structure uh, for corporate governance? Um, See, Anupam, before I go into uh, the good structure for governance, let me uh, share some basic principles, the basic, uh, uh, the few tenets on which good governance is based. So, so are you going to talk about the historical context? Uh, I'll come to that in a bit. So any good governance code, it basically uh, looks at three things in the company. It looks at creating more transparent mechanism, transparency between the corporations, uh, you know, how the corporations work. It looks at uh, creating a disclosure mechanism, disclosure uh, whereby directors um, uh, share the information, uh, inside information with the shareholders and sometimes even to the outsiders, um, other stakeholders. Then it looks at creating a more accountable uh, you know, mechanism, accountability you know, in a sense that you know, uh, board of directors become answerable for their business decisions to the shareholders. A good structure for governance would include, uh, would, would bear in mind uh, the culture. When I talk about culture, I mean to say the, the business ethics of a com uh, of corporation. Um, it would keep in mind uh, the general uh, overall regulatory framework. It will keep in mind that disclosure standards are at par with the global standards. Um, and um, there's a transparent regime whereby a shareholder can seek information from the board of directors where this required. So it's interesting, I mean, you have put some context into this entire concept of corporate governance. Can you give me uh, some background about when and how the debate on corporate governance started? Most of the time, we, we always mistake a Canterbury Committee to be the starting point of corporate governance debate globally. Uh, but I would take you back to 1932. Uh, in 1932, there were two scholars at Harvard University who published their book, Modern Corporations and Private Property. And there they developed a thesis 
where they talked about how agency problem creeped into corporation. But this uh, research by Burns and Bays, though it is seen as the uh, foundation for corporate governance, the formal debate started in 1990s, um, if I may take you back to the UK, where uh, a formal uh, committee was constituted by FRC under the uh, ages of Sir Adrian Canberry. Now, just to give you a little background about why this committee was constituted, uh, you'll be aware of Asian crisis. Now, even before that, there were crises in the US. Uh, there was World Chrome crisis. There was uh, Maxwell, uh, you know, communication. Mm, you know, there was big fraud happening in Maxwell communication. There were audit firms, um, you know, audit firm Enron. It collapsed because of uh, corporate um, governance failed in the company. And uh, one common thing that came uh, from all these cases was there was something definitely missing in the governance in these companies. While one co in one case was more about the audit fraud and the other was more about director's role in the company. Uh, but the common thread was that the board of the directors, uh, they did not behave in the manner that shareholders uh, expected them to behave. Uh, so in this light, what happened that the the stock market in most of these countries collapsed and investors withdrew their money and they're very shy of you know investing back in the company but business had to grow and business had to cont continue so for that uh, you know it was realized that we had to reinstate investors faith in the market and uh, probably you can got the right choice because um, Adrian Cadbury enjoyed confidence of business people and investors um, he was a uh, uh, you know, he was a uh, he's been he'd been a CEO for twenty four years with Cadbury, and uh, he he did a very intensive study and came out with a ninety over ninety page report uh, about some issues and recommendations of corporate governance. See, the key suggestions of Cadbury committee report was uh, firstly uh, they they found that uh, CEOs uh, or uh, the chief uh, executive officers in the companies they had to be answerable. To someone so uh, there was a pressing need they found there was a pressing need to separate the role of CEO and a chairman now uh, one has to be mindful that in the UK there's a unitary board structure so those board uh, the board of directors they lack some sort of supervision and Cadbury committee found that you know when a role gets immersed into a single person uh, supervision um, you know it's a it leads to a bad board, a board oversight so for a good board oversight, they found that first thing needs to be done is to separate the role of CEO from chairman. I will not do justice by uh, just uh, spelling out a few key recommendations of Cadbury committee. There were several recommendations, but just to highlight a few. Uh, see, one recommendation was about the auditors. They found that uh, the auditors uh, did not have a very uh, effective uh, uh, participation in corporations in a sense that uh, they did not get involved uh, in governance of corporations. Um, so one of the recommendations was first uh, that uh, auditors, in including external auditors, they must attend the board meetings, annual general meeting and board meetings. The other thing they found was that, you know, independence of auditor, like in, in Enron's case, independence of auditor was, uh, uh, was largely the question. So the recommendation was that the auditors must be independent. Now, to achieve that, it further recommended that the audit committee should be largely comprised should largely comprise of independent directors. As another recommendation was that uh, the appointment committee, the remuneration committee, uh, and the audit committee must be separate because studies had shown that uh, there was a question about who would watch the watchdog. Uh, you know, the directors they appointed their friends themselves. And they also fix their own remuneration and uh, they also check themselves. So it was not the right, it was not the proper objective and independent uh, board that shareholders aspire to, to have in a company. So it was uh, suggested that these three roles must be separated. And in all these three committees, there were there should be enough independent directors. So the idea was to have at least one third of the board as independent directors. If I could, uh, you know, discuss a few other, uh, you know, recommendation that uh, Cabinet Committee had recommended, which is also relevant uh, till today, it would be about removing the permanency of NEDs from the board. I recall uh, Cadbury Committee talking about that uh, 
there is a possibility of uh, NEDs who serve for a long time on the board, they may uh, develop some sort of relationship with the board. So to avoid that, uh, they recommended that there must be a term appointment. And when I say term appointment, it means only for a fixed period. So this is another suggestion was uh, given by Cadbury Committee. And as regards the remuneration of NEDs, uh, Cadbury Committee suggested that uh, uh, you know there should not be any share options be given to NEDs. Uh, though board must look into the remuneration, it must be attractive for them enough to serve as um, you know serve as a watchdog on the board. But uh, Cadbury Committee was uh, against giving ESOPs. Uh, the, this is interesting, Anupam, because uh, uh, no, despite having the recommendation made by the committee, uh, you know, right now we see that many jurisdictions they do offer these jobs to independent directors. Now, in India, the law does not allow that. Though a recommendation was made by uh, to the to the ministry, uh, you know, to make a reform in the Companies Act, but that was not that was not considered. That was not given effect to. Dr. Shekhar, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the Singapore corporate governance? Uh... Um, I must say that Singapore has adopted uh, one of the best set of governance practices uh, in Asia. It is one country that uh, has led to a different identity uh, in among Asian nations when we talk about uh, you know development of legal jurisprudence. If I go back to, to the development of corporate governance in Singapore, I see two main drivers for uh, development of corporate governance in Singapore was uh, a vision and crisis. And vision because since independence, Singapore envisioned to be a nation that uh, gave impetus to business, that became the heart of global economy, and it was very keen to integrate itself with the global economy. The government announced a strategic shift uh, whereby it tried to control less the corporations and uh, gave a um, sort of impetus in form of taxes, in form of business setup, uh, you know, establishing business, registration of companies. Interestingly, what happened was uh, while the government was very keen on liberalizing the business, uh, re uh, business regulations, uh, that was the time when Asian crisis happened and uh, that was the time probably the government took a step back and thought about how to implement the idea of uh, having a lighter touch in form of regulation and still being able to create more room for innovation. So this was something that uh, came as a challenge for the, gov the government. In the light of that, government introduced its first corporate governance court in 2001. And uh, the 2001 court um, in Singapore was primarily uh, influenced by the Cadbury Committee report in the UK well, you, you've mentioned uh, crisis, uh, so how, how, how does uh, crisis govern uh, the, uh, how, how does it drive the governance? Yeah. Yes, I forgot to mention earlier Boom, that uh, uh, the other driver for uh, formal code for corporate governance that came in Singapore was crisis and uh, Singapore had its own fate with uh, corporate scams and scandals uh, which made the government, the regulators worried. And uh, we had the case of Baring Bank. Now, uh, Baring Bank's case was almost a decade after the crisis of Pan Electric Industries, which is Pan EI in short. Now, in 1999, uh, which was a, a, just a few years after Baring Bank's case, another major crisis hit Singapore. And this was known as Klopp Saga. I mentioned three cases, uh, but uh, I still believe that the biggest case of scandal, the biggest scandal that uh, emerged in Singapore was not um, these but the Chinese aviation oil case. This case happened in 2004 and um, since then uh, we see that uh, you know the regulators have tried to address the corporate governance issue that arose in each of these cases and tried to uh, you know make the regulatory regime stronger and um, board of directors more answerable. Interestingly, it's seen that every time a change in the regulation is brought in was in the backdrop of a corporate scams. Um, so we see that corporate governance norms have not been very forward looking. It has rather been very backward looking when laws have been made in retrospect. And I think that is the reason why, uh, you know, the laws have not been very stringent, very strict, because it lacks a, some, a sort of future vision. Uh, you know, the regulators, uh, in my view, 
have not been able to envision as to what can happen in future. Uh, most of these norms are uh, in an, is an attempt to uh, you know fill in the gaps that existed in, um, in in audit, in regulation, in accountability norms, in disclosure norms, in in history. Uh, these are interesting case studies that uh, you quoted. Uh, but what, according to you, are the gaps in corporate governance in Singapore that you see as major concerns? Anupam, the gaps uh, in Singapore corporate governance go, uh, and uh, I must say that these gaps are not limited to Singapore, but also seen in many other jurisdictions, uh, are many. Uh, you know, the first issue is about director's remuneration. In Singapore Directorship Report 2014, it was revealed that only a third, that is 31% of listed companies, disclose the precise remuneration of the directors on a named basis when the court demands it. So this lack of will or voluntary disclosure by the board. And um, interestingly, if I can uh, bring um, a UK narrative here, uh, you know, while uh, UK was uh, re-looking into its uh, Companies Act 2016, uh, 2006, uh, you know, there was a recommendation by the steering group that uh, directors must disclose their financial review. They must submit their financial review by the end of the year. And there was a lot of political pressure at that point. And uh, what, they, what the UK settled for was only giving a business review as against a financial review. So you see, there's a lot of politics around forcing directors to reveal their, uh, you know, remuneration, and um, you know the business houses have been successful in justifying it. Of course, there are many other issues like quality of independent directors. We see that there's a trend about including more and more independent directors on the board, but again, the question is, uh, you know, who determines the quality of independent directors? Who appoints them? In the end of the day, it's the board of directors appointing independent directors. So, how independent would be that independent directors? Uh, you know, the regulations have tried to push towards a more accountable regime for independent directors, a more pro liability regime for independent directors, in the sense that uh, there was a time when uh, they had more rights than and zero liability. In India, we see that the general code for duties for directors. It also makes independent directors liable in the same context. Of course, uh, the test of negligence is uh, higher. There has to be an actual knowledge. The knowledge test applies there. And then you have the category committee recommendations uh, of not giving them some ESOPs or more incentives. Uh, in India, there's a cap on how much you could pay to an independent director. And uh, the cap suggests that you cannot, they cannot be well remunerated because it was found that uh, in past that Independent directors are very passive when it came to governance, but taking a lot of money from the company as a remuneration. So now the law says that uh, you cannot be, they have to be given what is called a sitting fee instead of remuneration. There cannot be any pension scheme for them. Uh, so I think this is another challenge that we face, you know. Um, how do you really incentivize them to be active? Uh, uh, and Anupam, I will also uh, bring to your notice that. Uh, the recommendations of Canterbury Committee, it comes from a very, very different business landscape. Canterbury Committee recommendations, they were, it came from a, from a business, uh, business landscape which had a dispersed shareholding. Unlike in Asia, we see that most of the business houses have a concentrated shareholding. So what is missed in most of these studies on corporate governance is that the nation's peculiar uh, issues are missed. And in, in effort of creating a more harmonious regime for all the countries, we try to adopt those recommendations without even keeping in mind the peculiar issues that exist at, at home front. Um, in Asia, for instance, dominant shareholding structure is, is writ large on the face of uh, corporate governance issues. Especially in India, I could say, the role of promoters. There were two recent cases of Tata and Cyrus uh, Ministry where at the first time in history of India, independent director was removed from the board by a board resolution. It has never happened in India before. And there's another case of Infosys. Uh, Infosys uh, was formed initially by a person called Mr. Narayan Murthy, who was seen as a pioneer in corporate governance code. And in his own company, there were issues about interference with board independence, where the CEO complained 
that Mr. Murthy was inter interfering with the, with the decision making of the company despite having stepped down from the board. Dr. Shekha, can you share some common issues of corporate governance faced by countries? Uh, another common issues faced by countries in in area of corporate governance is uh, firstly about uh, the accountability of board. It stems from the fact that uh, the boards have close with power, and if you look at the companies act in various countries, many powers management decisions that board takes are not even subject to shareholders' uh, review. For instance, uh, though shareholders have a right to dividend, it is the management who has to announce the dividend. And if management feels that dividend should not be distributed, rather be used for future business, so be it. And there has been examples where board has not given dividends to shareholders. And here, when I say shareholders, I mean public shareholders primarily. But they have taken back home huge remuneration package and a part of the remuneration package was bonuses. So I think the board accountability is the first issue. Then remuneration of directors is another issue. In 2007 crisis, it was found that though most of the companies struggled to do well, and the balance sheet spoke a very, very sad story, the remuneration of the directors was still very high. And um, they, they, they took home a huge uh, chunk of money despite company not doing well. Of course, the laws have tried to check by having a remuneration committee, but not much has been done in, in practice. The third issue that I find is shareholders' passivity. Ordinary shareholders, they do not participate in governance. So you may see FIIs as shareholders who are keen to participate, but uh, the ordinary shareholders are not very keen in the governance mechanism. They do have a voting right, but they don't uh, use that. But uh, you know, it's interesting to see how the jurisprudence is evolving because in case we take away the voting rights of ordinary shareholder, we're taking away the teeth. At least some sort of mechanism they have to check the behavior of directors and board. Right now under law, they can file a case for oppression mismanagement. They can ask for a derivative uh, action. So let's see how things translate in future. But uh, shareholders' passivity has definitely been uh, the core of concerns in corporate governance. Thank you for your time, Dr. Shikha, and I wish you good luck uh, for the book and uh, an excellent introduction of, on corporate governance. Uh, thank you, Anupam, for having me here. And uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, the talk.